So for everybody who's with us in-house, thank you so much for being here this morning. For those of you that are watching online, welcome. And this morning, we're starting a brand new series. I'm calling it Rooted. Would you say that with me? Rooted. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be taking a look at uh, Galatians chapter 5, where we, where we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you know, where you're rooted, what you are rooted in, determines the kind of fruit you manifest in your life. You know, if you have tomato plants, and they're planted in really clayish soil, soil that's not very rich in nutrients, They may actually produce the right kind of fruit, but they're not going to produce the quantity or the quality of the fruit. And how many of you know in our lives, Jesus wants us to produce much fruit and fruit that will last? Not just here on earth, but we're talking about fruit that lasts forever. And so for that to happen, we must be rooted in the things of the Spirit. But you know what? We get rooted in all kinds of different things. And what you are rooted in determines what you manifest in your life. So if you are, if you are rooted in worldliness, what do you think your life is going to manifest? It's going to uh, manifest worldliness. If you spend too much time in social media and that's where you're rooted right there, then guess what your life's going to produce? It's going to produce envy. It's going to produce jealousy, the things that end up happening when we look at everybody's perfect Instagram, you know, Instagram perfect life that they post up there, and then we just look at our own life that just seems like a big old mess. And so it's important that we live by the Spirit. In fact, we're going to put this verse up here right now, and would you read the underline with me? So I say, live by the Spirit. Would you say that with me? Live by by the Spirit. Let me continue on. Live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, What is debauchery? That's like just lawlessness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, drunken orgies, and the like. When he says, and the like, what he's saying is, guys, this is not even an exhaustive list. This is like just the tip of the iceberg. So when we talk about the desires of our flesh, we kind of know what we're talking about right there, right? I think we understand that. And so then he goes on and he says this, and I warn you that those that live like this, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and its desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so if you are rooted in the Spirit, that, that's where your life is grounded. It's grounded in a Spirit-filled and Spirit-led life. The Bible tells us that what will happen is over time, your life will start to produce and manifest that which your life is rooted in. And so he tells us what that fruit of the Spirit, or the fruit of being rooted in a Spirit-led, Spirit-filled life is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many of you think those sound like really good things? And, you know, we don't produce those in and of ourselves. We can't do it. And so the Bible says the key here is being rooted in the Spirit. But by contrast, he says, but when you're rooted in the flesh, it's going to produce all kinds of fleshy things like jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, envy, drunkenness, 
Drunkenness is just a general way of saying addiction, things that we get addicted to. And so we say, boy, which one of those sounds better to me? Which do I want? A life that's rooted in the flesh that produces all this destructive stuff or a life that is rooted in the Holy Spirit that produces these other positive things that we desire in our lives. And so to have these good things, we must be rooted in the Holy Spirit. But here's the challenge, you guys. For us to do that, we must truly believe that the life God has for us is better than what our flesh desires. How many of you would at least raise your hand and say, in faith, I believe that. I believe that what God has for me is better than what my flesh craves, what my flesh is longing for. And so we're talking about this, this rooted life, and it involves being detached or uprooted from the flesh so we can be rooted in the Spirit. And how many of you know sometimes that's easier said than done, right? I always like the story of Blondin. How many of you have heard of the tightrope walker? This is well over 100 years ago. His name was Blondin. Who'd heard of him? Okay. He, uh, he was made famous because he would uh, tightrope walk across Niagara Falls. Pretty amazing. And he drew a crowd on both sides, on the American side, on the Canadian side, and people would cheer him on. And he'd get to the other side, and he'd do different, different things. One day, he loads up a wheelbarrow. And he asked, how many of you think I can push this wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls? And people cheer, Blondin, we believe. We know you can. And, of course, he goes across the falls with the wheelbarrow. And then he loads it up with a bunch of bricks. He says, how many of you think I can cross this tightrope across Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow full of bricks? Yes, Blondin, we believe. Blondin, Blondin, Blondin. And they're cheering. And he crosses to the other side. And everybody's amazed. And then he asks, how many of you believe I could cross Niagara Falls with a man in the wheelbarrow? Blondin, we believe. We believe. Blondin, Blondin, Blondin. And then he asks, all right, I need a volunteer. No volunteers, man. <laughs> no. Here's the thing about it. Here's the thing about it, you guys. We can say we believe. We believe that Jesus can get us to the other side. But at some point, we have to have the faith to get into the wheelbarrow. We have to have the faith to trust that he can actually do that. And you know, true discipleship is found in trusting that our lives can be in Jesus' hand. You know, the, the key to thriving in life, how many of you want to thrive in your life? It's not a trick question. You guys want to thrive, right? And the key to thriving in your life is being dislodged from this life that's rooted in the flesh, which creates all kinds of baggage and problems, but instead being rooted in the Holy Spirit. So, living a spirit-rooted life. Jesus said these words. If anyone would come after me, he must deny. Would you say the word deny? Deny himself, take up his cross daily. Would you say that with me? Take up his cross daily and follow me. So, we're talking, this is the introduction to this series on rooted. And right here is kind of the foundation for that right there because Jesus is telling us for us to have a spirit-rooted life, it involves in the same way that we deny our flesh. We deny it. And I did some study on this, and the word deny means exactly what Peter did at the trial of Jesus. Remember at Easter we talked about that. We talked about how Jesus was being led off to trial, and Peter's warming himself by a fire out uh, in the courtyard, and a servant girl points him out and says, hey, you're one of his followers. Your accent gives you away. I recognize you. And what does it say that Peter did? He denied that he even knew Christ. He says, I don't even know the man. 
And so for us, it's the same word. But the difference is, we're not denying Christ. We're denying our flesh. We're saying, flesh, you're not running the show here. You're not in charge here. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, we just read how the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. We know what they are. I don't even need to re, uh, read that to you. But here's a challenge that we have for me personally and maybe you as well. Sometimes I feel like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Anybody? Because there's this part of me that sometimes I get it right. I am loving. I'm kind. I'm compassionate. Sometimes that's there. But then there's these other times where there's jealousy, where there's envy, where there's selfish ambition. And the Bible tells us that these two things, this, this flesh life and this spirit life, that they're, they're in conflict. They're at war with one another. In fact, Paul goes on and he says, it's just an all-out war with our flesh. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. How does an athlete train its body to do what it should? You ever see these uh, runners, people that are up early, you're driving to work? Reese, you're, you are a, a runner, you jog. Do you jog in the wintertime? You don't run. So here's the thing about it. You know, you see these guys, you're driving in, it's dark, it's cold, it's wet, and they're running. And you're, you're thinking, wow, that's pretty amazing. And maybe you feel inspired. You say, you know what? I think tomorrow I'm going to start doing that. That looks like a good thing to do. And tomorrow comes along, and it's dark, it's wet, it's cold. And what do you tell yourself? I'll start that tomorrow. I'll start that tomorrow. And we think, well, gosh, they make it look so easy. But really what they've learned is this, is they've disciplined their body to make it do what it should do. It's like an athlete training the body to do what it should do. In Corinthians 9.27, Paul says, I beat my body, I make it my slave. I beat my body and I make it my slave. Paul understood that there's an all-out war for us to be controlled by the flesh. The flesh wants what it wants when it wants it. And what he's saying is if we are going to be spirit-controlled people, that when that flesh is screaming out, feed me, Seymour, it's lunchtime and I'm hungry. When the flesh is screaming out, I want what I want when I want it. The spirit man tells the flesh, shut up, get behind me. Because today, we're going to do what Jesus wants. And you know, our bodies, for us to be willing to do what Jesus wants to do, we must make sure our spirit, that our spirits are controlled by him, and we're not being controlled by the flesh. Because if we're controlled by the flesh, we will always default to things that are contrary to, to the Holy Spirit. Now, when I talk about doing this, how many of you know, if you're going to do what I just talked about, it requires the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, amen? Because we don't have it. You know, we see people, uh, you know, you guys get up early, you come to church on a Sunday morning. Some of you, you come in very early. You come in and you cook breakfast, you come in, you set out coats, you serve people, you help out. And it's easy to say, well, gosh, it must be easy for them. But actually, it's not. It's no easier for them as well. But what they've done is they've crucified the flesh. The flesh says, no, nah, just hit snooze. They're not going to miss you. Just sleep in. The reason you're here today is because you made a decision to deny what the flesh wants to do and instead, you came to be more deeply rooted in the things of the Spirit. That's why you're here. It doesn't make it any easier for you than it does somebody else. But what you've learned is, I discipline my body. I tell my body what it's going to do, not vice versa. 
because my body will always tell me, nah, just hit the snooze, just unplug the clock, throw that in the closet. And at some point you say, body, you're not running the show here. You're not calling the shots, okay? You're going to do what I want you to do. And right now I want you to get out of bed, get your feet on the floor, get out the door, get in the car, and go worship with the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Jesus says to take up your cross daily, to take it up daily. You know, a a condemned criminal, in that day, they would take up their own cross and they would carry it to the place of their execution. And obviously a one-way journey, okay, one-way journey. But the Bible tells us, as far as it is with our flesh, that that's a daily journey. He said, we take up our cross daily. We crucify our flesh daily. In Galatians 5.24, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, who here belongs to Jesus? Anybody in here? Okay, so those of you who your hands are up, he says, those of you that belong to Christ Jesus, you have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. And Jesus says, we do that every day, every day. And you guys, here's the real challenge with crucifying our flesh daily. Have you ever noticed this? You always got one free hand. Because I can nail my feet, and I can stretch out this one, and I can nail this. But I always got one free hand. And I don't know about you, but it seems like, although I may start out good in the morning, saying, God, I want you to control my life. I want a spirit-controlled life. I'm putting the flesh to death. Partway through the day, I'm here pulling the nails out. I'm pulling the nails out, and I'm back down there just living my own life. You know, uh, Paul put it this way in Romans. He said that we are like living sacrifices, that we are laying our lives on the altar, offering them to the Lord every day. And you know the big problem with a living sacrifice? They always want to crawl right back off the altar. (laughs) That's what we do. And this is exactly why Jesus said it's imperative that we crucify the flesh daily. Because every day, all of a sudden, there's envy. There's jealousy. There's rage. There's these things that pop up that are from the flesh. And for us to live a spirit-rooted life, it's a daily act of denying that flesh so that we can live in the spirit. So, just to reiterate what Jesus said, he says, take up the cross, okay, and follow me daily. So, you got to believe that the spirit-rooted life is actually a better life, or you're never going to do that. You'll never deny your flesh and take up a cross and die to your flesh daily. You will never do that unless you are convinced that a spirit-rooted life is better. Would you guys agree with me? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good. All of that is much better than fits of rage, jealousy, addiction, drunken orgies, sexual immorality. What God has is better than what my flesh longs for. And unless you believe what he has for you is better, you're going to have a hard time doing what he's called us to do. And I want to share with you one of my favorite stories. If you've been around here, you've heard this one before. But for some of you, it's a brand new one. It's a new story for you. Story of Jenny and her mom. Jenny's a little five-year-old girl blonde hair, cute as a button, five-year-old girl with curly locks. And they're at the the dime store. Now, some of you say, what's a dime store? (laughs) Well, the dime store is what we think now is a dollar store, okay? Inflation. (laughs) It used to be the dime store. Does anybody remember the dime stores? And they're at the dime store, and they're at the checkout stand, and Jenny sees this pink foil package with beautiful pearls inside. And so she pulls at her mom and says, Mama, 
I'd really love to have those. Those are so beautiful. And Mama picks up the package and looks at it and turns it over. Says, that's a, it's $1.95. I mean, that's almost $2. I'll tell you what, when you get home, how about you open your penny bank? Let's see what you have. Your birthday's next week. And Grandma usually gives you a nice, crisp $1 bill. Maybe she'll do that again. And you can maybe do some extra chores around the house. Miss Johnson next door, she loves you. Maybe you could do some chores for her as well. So sure enough, they get home. Jenny opens up her penny bank. There's 17 cents. The next week comes along, and sure enough, she got a brand new $1 bill from Grandma. And she did extra chores at home, and Mom gave her something. She went to Mrs. Johnson's house and pulled out some dandelions. She got paid a dime for that. And after some time, she'd collected enough money to buy the dime store pearl necklace. And when she put it on, she felt beautiful. She felt grown up. She wore it everywhere. She wore it to kindergarten. She wore it to Sunday school. She wore it to play. She even wore it to bed. The only place she didn't wear it was when she took a bubble bath or when she went swimming. Because Mama said, you may want to take that off when there's water. We don't want it to turn your neck green. <laughs> Not only did Jenny have a wonderful mom, she also had a very loving father. No matter what was going on at night, when it was Jenny's bedtime, he was sure to tuck her in. Sometimes he'd read a story, always say a prayer, and give her a kiss on the cheek. And one night when he comes in, he says, Jenny, do you love your daddy? And Jenny says, you know, I do, Dad. Daddy, I love you so much. And Daddy says, how about you give me your pearl necklace? And Jenny says, no, Daddy, not my pearl necklace. I love them. I love it. How about I give you my princess pony, the white one with the pink tail? She's my favorite. How about I give you the princess pony? And Daddy says, no, sweetheart, that's okay. And he gave her a kiss on the cheek. Good night. They went through their normal routine, and a few days later, again, he broached the question. Jenny, do you love your daddy? Do you know that your daddy has the best for you? Yes, daddy, I know. And yes, I know you love me, and I love you. Jenny, how about you give me your pearl necklace? No, daddy, not my pearl necklace. I love my pearl necklace. How about you take my baby doll, the one I just got for my birthday? I'll give you that. And Daddy says, no, sweetheart, that's okay. And he gave her a kiss goodnight. A few more days go by, and this time when Daddy comes in the room, Jenny's sitting on her bed, crisscross applesauce, and her little chin is quivering. And she has one lone tear streaming down her face. As she reached out her hand like this, what is it, Jenny? As she dropped the dime store pearls into daddy's hands. And he took those and put them in his pocket. And I, almost simultaneously, he pulled out of his back pocket something he had had the entire time, a blue velvet box. And when he opened it, genuine pearls harvested from the rocky shoals of the South Pacific, valuable. And he placed those on Jenny's neck. The thing about it was this. Is that he had had the real treasure the entire time. He was just waiting for her to come to the place where she was ready to let go of the dime store trinket. So that she could finally receive a true treasure. And the reason I tell you that story is because we are just like Jenny that we are so busy holding on to our old life. We're holding on to this old stuff. It's not until we believe that what God has for us is better than what we have for ourselves that we are finally willing to let go of the trinkets so that we could finally receive the true treasure that God has for us. You know, when you think about what God has for you, by comparison, it's similar to like comparing a dime store 
pearl necklace through a true treasure. A true pearl necklace harvested in the South Pacific among the rocky shoals. Or you might even compare it to something you get from a Cracker Jacks box compared to the 45 carat Hope Diamond on display at the Smithsonian Institute. One entire room has been dedicated just to that one diamond. A true American treasure. Priceless. Can't put a price on it. The point that I'm making is this, is that what God has for you is so much better than what you have for yourself. But unless you believe that, you won't let go of the other stuff. You won't let go of your addiction. You won't let go of your sexual immorality. You won't let go of those things unless you actually believe that what God has for you is better than what you have for yourself. You know, as we're beginning this new series that I'm calling Rooted, for us to truly be rooted in the Holy Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit begins to be manifest in our lives, then that begins with this, you guys, that we are willing to deny our flesh, to take up our cross, to die on it daily, die to the flesh, die to the old life daily, because every day it starts screaming at you again. And so every day, but here's the thing, we will never do that unless we are utterly convinced that what God has for us is much better than what we have for ourselves. Amen? How many of you believe what God has for you is much better than what you have for yourself? Alex, can you come? And we're going to go ahead and close our time in worship. But as we do that, I want to give you an opportunity today. Is there anybody here, man, you've been holding on to the old stuff, the old drunkenness, the old unforgiveness, the old rage and brawling and fight, the old flesh. You are holding on to that. And today the Holy Spirit is tapping you on the heart. And he's saying, listen, will you let go of that? Drop that into my hand. Because the treasure I have for you, I've had it all along. I've just been waiting on you to let go of the dime store trinkets so that you could truly receive the priceless treasure that comes from having a spirit-rooted life. A spirit-filled and led and controlled life. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity this morning. If you're saying, man, I need to do that. I need to dislodge from the flesh and get rooted in the Holy Spirit. I need to commit my life or recommit my life to the Lord. And if that's you this morning, would you raise your hand where you are right now? Raise it up high. Amen. I see your hands in here. I see them in this place. Church family, can we pray this prayer together? Dear Lord, this morning I am convinced that what you have, what you have for me, is better than what I've had for myself. So this morning I lay the old life on the altar. I lay that flesh-controlled life at your feet. I crucify it daily. And I invite you to come into my life and fill me with the power of your spirit that I may remain deeply rooted in you. Because the fruit you produce is lasting fruit. That's what I want. That's what I, that's what I long for. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.
Can we stand together, church family? I think for some of us, we need to actually go through a physical uh, action in your mind. Take that stuff that you've been holding on to, put it right there in your hand. You might even like Jenny gesture like you're taking off the old necklace. The dime store trinket. And you're putting it right there. And then just drop it. Right into his hands. Drop it into his hands. Hallelujah.